Well, hi there. My name is Clint Laidlaw. I'm a serious Lego nerd and a zoologist. So when I saw these rad insects were gonna be coming out, I got pretty excited. And then I saw this giraffe. At that point, I was like, what else are they making? Because I think we have to talk about them. What they got right and uh, where they probably could have done better. But I'll tell you, I'm pretty impressed. So let's check them out. I love this giraffe. It's honestly what put me over the top that we needed to do this entire video. And not because of how good it looks, though it does look awesome, but because of what it can do, which I'll show you here in a minute. But it does look so good. And the thing that I most appreciate about the way that it looks is that it looks this much like a giraffe without using a single piece that was created to make a giraffe. No unique special pieces at all. I mean, I love things like Lego horses, sharks, dragons, dinosaurs, and crocodiles, but they're made out of pieces created specifically to be horses, sharks, dragons, dinosaurs, and crocodiles. And they've made giraffes like that before. But this doesn't have a single piece designed to be part of an animal of any kind, let alone a giraffe. Without seeing the box or the instructions, if somebody put all the pieces required to make this set in front of you, you would have almost no idea what this was going to be. And yet, it looks amazing. It's honestly my favorite type of animal art. The type that at first glance, or from a distance, looks absolutely perfect. But the closer and longer you look, the more you notice that they captured the essence of the appearance without copying its appearance down to the finest details. And mimicking the fine details would be impossible to do with Legos at this scale. But this is a genuine piece of art. The neck here is one of my very favorite parts of all. I love when they use conventional pieces in unconventional ways. And the neck is an excellent example of this because it's upside down. All of the pieces are upside down and it has a really cool mane which is really an interesting thing about giraffes because it's very similar to the mane of horses, and yet giraffes and horses are not very closely related. We'll actually be getting into how they are related in a video here pretty soon. But this is a great example of convergent evolution and it's well represented in this model. And they did a really cool job with the hair on the tail as well. As is the case with real giraffes, the tail hair is darker than the mane. And again, it uses no unique pieces. Though, uh, this part right here is a minifigure head. It has great length and really nice articulation, which is a really a great part of this entire model. It bends in all sorts of cool ways. It is overall highly, though not fully posable, with many movable joints that I'll get into here in a second. On top of its head, it has two ossicones which are the biggest indicator that this is likely a female giraffe. Ossicones are the horn-like structures on the heads of giraffes. I say horn-like because they're not horns, though they are weapons of war. Horns are permanent pointy projections consisting of a core of live bone surrounded by a sheath of keratin, which is very different from antlers, which are dead bone and have no outer sheath, but are generally shed annually. Ossicones are overall more similar to horns. They're a living bone core, but they're covered in skin instead of keratin. And that bone actually starts out as cartilage and it doesn't fuse to the skull until the giraffe reaches maturity. And the reason I can tell this is likely a female is because she still has the dark tufts of hair on top of her ossicones that are usually worn off during giraffe male to male combat which is quite a thing to watch. Males also tend to have a third ossicone called a median ossicone that's kind of right about here, sort of in the, the middle of their face. Not to mention the other projections on the ventral side of the giraffe, which uh, would have made my day had those been included. But the thing about this giraffe that really persuaded me that this video had to happen was that it showed off very clearly one of the most shocking things about giraffes. Giraffes have disproportionately short necks. You heard me right. The necks of giraffes are disproportionately short. And before you storm out of here in a huff, I want you to think about a horse. 
When a horse needs to get a drink, what does it do? It puts its head down and drinks. Now think about a cow, a deer, an antelope, really any other ungulate. When they need to take a drink, what do they do? But when a giraffe needs to take a drink, what does it do? Because giraffes have disproportionately short necks, at least compared to their disproportionately long legs. Giraffes are notoriously tall, and yes, they have long necks, but the biggest reason for their height is shockingly not because of their long necks, but because of their extra long legs. And I love that this model shows that off perfectly. It took so much effort to make that happen. And they not only did it, but they did it in such a way that it looks perfect in this pose or upright. Thanks not only to the ball sockets in its shoulders, but also in its toes, not ankles. Their ankles are actually right about here. Giraffes have long legs, but much of that length is just foot, and they walk on their toe tips, unguligrade, which is a lot like digitigrade, where you walk on the toes, except all the way on the tips of the toes. And I know that I've been geeking out about this giraffe for a long time, and we have so many other rad bottles to get to, but I just can't stop before I tell you how giraffes avoid uh, blowing their own brains out. So I told you before that the neck is disproportionately short, and that's true, at least compared to the length of their legs. But it's still long, about 2.4 meters, which is almost 8 feet. Despite being composed of the same number of vertebrae as your neck, just seven, it is the majority of the length of the vertebral column. Which means that while they have a disproportionately short neck compared to their legs, they have an exceptionally short body. It also explains why they have this hump. It's formed by a huge nuchal ligament required to hold this head and neck up. Anyway, when a giraffe is standing fully upright, its head can be more than two and a half meters above its heart. That would be like if Robert Wadlow, the tallest man ever verified to have existed, had his heart in his feet. Can you imagine how much power that heart would need to have to pump blood all the way to that brain? Well, the answer is a lot. The giraffe has the highest blood pressure of any animal alive today. Though this does make me wonder how Brachiosaurus did it. Do you think that they had supplemental pumps somewhere in the neck itself? I might need to talk about sauropods next Dinosaur December. Anyway, it's a lot of pressure. And that's fine when it's pumping against gravity. But what happens when Robert Wadlow, heart in his feet, goes to get a drink by standing on his own hands with his arms spread out wide? All that pressure needed to fight gravity for a two and a half meter climb suddenly has gravity working with it instead of against it. Do you see the problem? Well, giraffes have all sorts of cool adaptations to deal with such high blood pressure generally, but they have an amazing system of valves in the neck and blood storage reservoirs to not only reduce blood pressure when the head is down, but to prevent them from getting the mother of all lightheadedness when they lift their heads back up. Anyway, we probably need a whole giraffe video in the future just so we can talk about all of this, but I have a ton of rad Lego sets to get to, so uh, I better call it there. Because look at these! These insects are amazing! Now the giraffe is part of the creator line of Legos, which means it can be built into three different models. If you'd like to see us review the other two in the future, please let us know in the comments. In fact, please let us know if you'd like to see more Lego videos in the future as well. But this set, which comes with three different models that don't require you to disassemble the other models, because they can all be built at the same time. And just like the giraffe includes no special pieces created exclusively for that model, the same almost certainly has to be true here, because these are from the ideas line. Which means that they were created by hobbyists and then gained enough popularity that LEGO decided to make them available. And this has to be at least part of the reason that this praying mantis has revolvers for feet. I love all I guess six of these insects, because 
uh, as it turns out, there's a little bee right here, and I just noticed a couple of little ladybugs or ladybird beetles right there as well. But I have to start with this Hercules beetle because it's really the one that jumped out to me first. And maybe that's because I've done a good part of my research with beetles, but it's so good. And what really jumped out to me is that they created it in such a way that it looks fantastic with the wings folded under the elytra or with the wings extended like this. Elytra, by the way, are the hardened protective first set of wings that you see in insects like beetles. This is a huge part of the reason that beetles are the most successful group of the most successful insects, which as a whole are the most successful group of animals on the planet. Because flight is handy, but wings are delicate. Which means that if you have wings, you probably can't go down in holes or hide under objects. You're kind of stuck out in plain sight, like butterflies and moths. But fortunately for insects, and as you can see really clearly on this bee, insects with wings tend to have four wings. And given the way that many insects fold their wings, this can mean that the first set can protect the second set, which is generally what you see in things like bees and moths. And it is helpful, though the first set can still easily be damaged. For this reason, the first set is often somewhat more durable, like those of the praying mantis. The first set is thicker and more leathery, and they're called tegmina. Not all mantises have long flight wings, but this one does, and it has its tegmina closed over the hind wings, which are the wings that are actually used for flight. And honestly, I'm fine with the choice to depict the mantis with the tegmina closed. That's how mantises are most of the time. Though if in the future they wanted to do a flower mantis with its tegmina and wings extended in their threat display, I can promise I'll get one of those and make another video. But elytra are very much like tegmina, but more sclerotized, meaning they're harder and lack the venation that is still present in tegmina. This means that beetles can be simultaneously armored like tanks and fly. They can wedge themselves into anything and still slip the surly bonds of earth. And for the same reason that I'm happy with the praying mantis having its wings closed, I would have been fine with this beetle looking, well, like this. It looks great, but they went above and beyond because it can also have the wings extended. And that reveals the same insane reality that you probably noticed the first time you picked up a ladybug, which is a, a beetle, not a bug, and its wings popped out before it flew away. The hind wings, these wings, are longer than the elytra, but they fold them when not in use, and that is how they fit under these shorter elytra. I wish that's how these worked. These just come off to allow the elytra to close, but I'm still pretty darn pleased. The wings even look really good. The wings on these beetles are this kind of transparent amber color with thick, dark veins, especially on the leading edge of the wing. I think they captured that really well. So the wings are great. I really appreciate the effort here to add segmentation to the dorsal segments of the abdomen. This beetle is seven inches long, including the thoracic horn, which makes it an exact one-to-one -one scale replica of an actual Hercules beetle, which is the longest species of beetle alive today, and they're exactly this big. Now, I want to talk about that thoracic horn, this guy. This is clearly a male, as females don't have the thoracic horn. And if you would ask the average person what these are, they would probably tell you jaws, but they aren't. They aren't even entirely on the head. Insects have three primary body regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. This horn is on the head of the Hercules beetle. The mandibles, the actual biting part of the beetle, would be down here, though they're not included in this model. And that's not really a flaw in my opinion. They are very small. The giraffe doesn't have a working mouth either, though it would be rad if a little purple prehensile tongue popped out of the giraffe mouth. This larger horn, the thoracic horn, as its name would suggest, is not on the head, but the thorax. It is a projection of the shield that covers part of the dorsal side of the beetle thorax called the pronotum. And these pseudo jaws formed by the head horn and the thoracic horn close when the beetle lifts its head. And that's exactly how they work on real beetles as well. 
though the thoracic horn on this guy is on a hinge and it can move down, which I assume is so that they could get the angle right, but real beetles can't do this. Just this. And I really appreciate that they even added some CD, which are like these little hairs that beetles have. They're so good, they got more back here. And they really nailed it with the placement of the legs. Because if you ever flip over a beetle, it will make you question some things that you thought you knew about insects. But only if you know quite a bit about insects. Because if you know quite a bit about insects, you will know that insects have a head with one pair of antennae, which this has, check. A thorax with three pairs of legs and as many as two pairs of wings. And an abdomen with no legs or wings. But when you flip over a beetle, it looks like it has one or two pairs of legs on the thorax, but at least one pair looks like it's coming off of the abdomen. So what the heck is going on? Well, I can tell you that I wondered about this for a very long time. And you were right, even though beetles made it look like you were wrong. And that is because you probably don't know where a beetle's thorax ends and its abdomen begins but the creator of this beetle did. If you look at a beetle from above with the elytra closed, you can see three pretty clear body regions, but you aren't really looking at the head, thorax, and the abdomen. You are looking at the head, pronotum, and elytra. Now the pronotum is on the thorax, but the thorax has three segments, the prothorax, the mesothorax, and the metathorax. Each segment possesses a single pair of legs, like a centipede, and the two posterior segments each possess a single pair of wings as well, but not the first. And this means that the elytra do not cover just the abdomen, but most of the mesothorax and all of the metathorax as well. They come from the mesothorax and cover the wings, second set of wings that come from the metathorax. The pronotum is mostly only covering the first thoracic segment, the prothorax. What all of this means is that the thorax is actually much longer than it appears. And while the last pair, or even the last two pairs of legs are below the elytra, they're still on the thorax. And the abdomen is much shorter than it appears. The gap right here should probably be a touch smaller and the abdomen a tiny bit longer, but given that Legos come in discrete and not continuous sizes, and uh, this is perfectly to scale, I don't think they could have done any better. I love this beetle. Okay, these are not made of Legos, or well, Lego bricks more accurately, but they are the longest snakes in the world. The only species that occasionally eat somebody something that they actually do with some regularity. But other than that, this is like the perfect pet snake. They are intelligent, hardy, they're excellent eaters, they're interactive and fun, they're just perfection. But growing to nearly 30 feet long does tend to make them a bit unreasonable for most people, myself included. And I never considered one, but now I have three. Because my friend Garrett Hartle from Reach Out Reptiles taught me one of the most amazing things I have ever learned. That there are island populations that have, well, all of the same awesome attributes of the giant reticulated pythons, but in comparatively itty bitty packages. Dwarf and super dwarf reticulated pythons. Not morphs, but dwarf localities of reticulated pythons. The perfect pet snake in the perfect sized package. These are, especially the super dwarfs, the absolute best pet snake in my opinion. If you told me that you could get only one snake ever, and you asked me what I thought you should get, I would tell you that this is the snake. But I would recommend that you get it from Reach Out Reptiles, the sponsor of this video. Not only because Garrett has been doing this longer than anyone else and can find the perfect retic to fit your needs and your dreams, but also because, well, there's a motive for people to sell you a giant snake and claim that it's a super dwarf. And I seriously cannot recommend a business more highly than Reach Out Reptiles. And right now, if you mention this video when you order anything from Reach Out, you can take 10% off of your order. You'll be getting legitimately the best pet snake 
from the best source and saving a little money all at the same time from Reach Out Reptiles. Now, where were we? This butterfly, the blue morpho, is probably the weakest of the three, but it's still pretty darn good. Again, it is life-sized. And honestly, from this side, it looks about as good as it can. Though these wing spots, other than these two eyeballs, are specially painted for this model. I like how they use different blues to simulate the iridescence of these butterflies. And they capture that there are actually four wings that overlap one another with the first pair on top of the second pair. The body looks pretty good. I really like these antennae. It's the same piece that was used for the tarsal claws on the Hercules beetle. So, what's the problem? Not much. Uh, I just said that it was the weakest of the three. But compared to the other two, it kind of feels like an afterthought. The stands that all three of these come on are... they're incredible. And for this one, the stand is... well, I mean, it's definitely the best part of all. My only real complaint is with the bottom side of the butterfly. I'm fine with the lack of mouth parts or legs, but Morpho wings are not black and blue on the ventral surface. They're brown with eye spots. They look really cool. And it just doesn't seem like it would have been that difficult for them to have done that. If the wings were just blue, I, I would get it. They just didn't do a bottom. But given that the bottom is made out of pieces that are not visible at all from above, why could they not make it look like the bottom of a Morpho wing? at least a little bit. It feels like they spent all day on the stand and threw the butterfly together at the last minute. The bee is great because it shows off the four wings. That's how I knew that it was a bee and not a bee mimic dipter and fly where the second set of wings is reduced to gyroscopic haltiers. But it's basically a minifig, except for the head which has giant tarsal claw antennae. It would have looked more like a bee if it had no antennae at all since theirs are fairly small and inconspicuous. These look like what you would get if you, uh, say, crossed a bee with a Texas Longhorn. Okay, so let's get over to the last one. Not the last set that we have, but the last one from this collection, the Praying Mantis. This is allegedly a Chinese mantis, which is the main mantis that you find here in Utah. I love them. But if that is so, it's a little large. And that's fine, nobody said that they had to be life-sized, but so far they were. And this one is larger than a real Chinese mantis, though there are mantises this large. And if you want to see me go look for them, please consider supporting us on Patreon. I promise that I will focus even more on crazy insects in our future trips, even more than I did in the Amazon. And uh, this video is still pretty amazing. I saw some really cool mantises down there. But right now, I want to talk about this one. It's so great. For starters, it is extremely, extremely poseable. Other than the fact that it can't open its tegmina, it can adopt pretty much any posture that a praying mantis can. Like the giraffe, it has one segment, in this case the prothorax, which is built upside down. That allowed a couple of technic pieces to be utilized for the arms. I'll get back to those here in a second. But I love the way that the prothorax meets up with the mesothorax. It's brilliant. It also explains why the tegmina, or in this case, tegma, since it only has one, doesn't move. The tegma in this set is a piece that is usually used as a helicopter blade or something like that, and they attach to the helicopter by a ratcheting joint that allows them to move up and down. And they could have used that hinge to move the tegma up, exposing the other tegma and the second set of wings below, but instead they used that hinge to attach the prothorax which allows this point of articulation between the prothorax and the metathorax that mantids have. It's so cool. And the back two pairs of legs are in the correct location, which is another example of a location that would throw you off if you didn't realize that the tegmina cover more than just the abdomen. And honestly, they can bend and twist in so many ways that you can pose this mantis perfectly. They even add some detail to show the segmentation of the abdomen. And with all of that said, we haven't even gotten to my favorite details. Because these raptorial forearms, they're incredible. They have all the articulation of praying mantis arms. I just wish they had that little eye spot on the inside, but I really can't complain. 
This isn't just amazing because it's made out of Legos. This is the best posable praying mantis model I have ever seen made out of any materials. The head is great, looks great. I love the eyes. I will talk more about those in a second. But my biggest complaint is with the head, though it's pretty forgivable. It comes off easily and is pretty much impossible to reposition without popping it off and changing the orientation of this little piece here. Kind of got to twist that. I wish it was on some sort of a ball and socket hinge, but you know, it's, it's totally workable. In every other way, it moves just like a mantis, and this one part needs to be rebuilt in order to pose it. Anyway, let's take a look at those eyes, and, and then we'll move on to our last two models. One is much better than the other, by the way. In fact, one of them may be the best model of all, and the other is clearly the worst. Uh, but those eyes. If you've ever looked into the eyes of a praying mantis, you might have noticed that it has little pupils that follow you wherever you go. It's creepy. But it gets creepier. Haunted mansion kind of creepy. Because if you do this at the same time as a friend, you will see that the mantis is looking at you. And your friend will see that the mantis is looking at them. It is looking at both of you right in the eyes at the same time. But you can only see it looking at you. So how is this possible? Well, I will start with the fact that it is looking at both of you. Even though those little pupils make it look like they only have two cartoon alien eyes, they actually have about 10,000 omatidia comprising two large compound eyes. They're looking in pretty much every direction all of the time though they see best through a region at the front of the compound eyes called the fovea. That is why their ability to turn their heads is so important. It allows them to see things clearly and with excellent binocular depth perception. Important if you grab stuff with your rad raptorial forelimbs. Those pupils, they aren't actually pupils. And uh, they sort of are pupils at the same time. But they aren't following either of you. The darkness that you see is called a pseudopupil. You see it when you look straight into an omatidium. When you look straight in, all of the light is being absorbed. If you see it in an angle, the light is reflected, so you don't see the darkness. Thus, the pseudopupil isn't really moving, but as you move, or the head of the mantis moves, which omatidia you are seeing head on, that changes, which is pretty bodacious. Which is more than I can say for this shark which actually looks better in real life than it does on the box. And part of that is because I built it differently. I just couldn't stand to build it with the pectoral fins on backwards. It's just wrong. Why? Why would they ask me to do that? Am I being punked? Now the insects told us exactly which species they were supposed to be, but uh, this one only told me that it is some sort of a deep sea creature. I had to use my skills as a zoologist to even identify it as a shark. Though the name on the set is fair, since this is another three-in-one that can be built multiple different ways. So again, let us know if you want to see more LEGO content in the future. But it really wasn't all that hard to identify it as a shark. It's not great. I mean, well, it might be a great white, but I could imagine a greater great white shark than this. It is definitely built, though, like a white shark, though there are five species of white sharks. The blunt snout and sharp cutoff from light to dark suggests great white, but the blue color suggests short fin mako, so it's kind of a hybrid. This is the smallest and least expensive set that we're covering today, so I can excuse that it is lacking some of the details that it might have had if it were a full-sized replica like our insects. I appreciate the gill slits, even if it only has four, and the nostrils. It's pretty cool. I love the counter shading, which just means that it's dark on top and light on the bottom, so it can't really be seen well looking down on it from above into the dark blue ocean or up from below against the light of the sky. I love the homo circle tail uh, with top and bottom lobes that are nearly identical in size. This is what you see in white sharks, but not in some of their crazy cousins. It has only one row of teeth, top and bottom, but I do like the creativity that they used in order to make those. With the mouth closed, and if you position it right, it really looks fairly good. 
With the mouth open, it looks really dumb. And that's just difficult because shark jaws are not attached to the skull and they protrude out when they bite in a way that would be, well, it'd be awesome, but it'd be really difficult to simulate with Legos. Really, my only gripe, assuming that you ignored the instructions that told you to put the pectoral fins on backwards, it would be the two missing fins. It has a dorsal fin, a caudal fin, uh, pectoral fins and pelvic fins, but no secondary dorsal fin and no anal fin. Plus the pelvic fins especially are just, they're just way too high on the body, though I do appreciate very much the creativity with regard to the pieces that they use to make them. And these crazy robot eyes, uh, those are definitely an interesting stylistic choice. Though not giving them a nictitating membrane was apparently an accurate stylistic choice. So this is a fun, inexpensive, but also kind of unimpressive set. It's certainly no work of art. But this is... Look at this thing! This is a male common kingfisher in the act of grabbing a bar of pure silver out of a pond. You can tell that it's male by looking at its beak. It's all black. Females, on the other hand, have a lot of orange on the mandible, which is the lower portion of the beak. But there are no differences other than that between male and female common kingfishers. The plumage is identical. That is unlike the most common kingfisher found in North America, the belted kingfisher, where females have a reddish-brown band across their front and on their sides that is absent in males. But in common kingfishers, that orange on the mandible is the only way to easily distinguish males from females. Overall, the aesthetic of this model is, I mean, it's astounding. It's beautiful. It's dynamic. It's a little bit larger than an actual kingfisher, but I have no problem with that. Overall, it's accurate enough that I could even see displaying it here in Clint's reptile room. I mean, it's a reptile after all. It gets a lot of things really, really right, which kind of throws into stark contrast the things that it gets unnecessarily wrong. But let's start with the good. Kingfishers are the most incredible birds. Not long ago, I informed you that if you don't like kingfishers, we can't be friends, or you're a small fish. And I stand by that statement. But if you are a small fish, I can totally see why you would hate, or at least fear, kingfishers. Have you ever watched one hunt? It's amazing. These birds sit out on a perch and just survey a body of water. Once they spot some fish, they fly out and dive straight into the water, grab a fish, and then come bursting back out of the water and fly back to their perch to enjoy their catch. They don't call them peasant fishers, you know. Well, the moment where they burst out of the water with their catch is really dynamically captured in this model. I cannot imagine a more engaging pose. And the job they did with the water and the cattails, it's, it's just beautiful and naturalistic. The base also rotates quite nicely, which is great for viewing this scene from all angles. The basic form of this bird is very accurate. It has the short tail, large head, and long bill of kingfishers with very seemingly reasonable proportions. So much of the coloration is stunningly accurate. For example, the chest and inside of the wings, they are this color. Though the bottom side of the flight feathers are not blue like this, uh, I think that's pretty forgivable though, given that they are the same pieces that you can view here from the back, and those are blue. And I think these little feather projections were trying to capture that grayish coloration as best they could. The detail in the coloration of the head is really accurate and shows great attention to detail. Though, one suggestion. The eyes are, for reasons that escape me, positioned a bit too high up on the head. Fortunately, like most LEGO sets, it comes with a few bonus pieces. If you just take away this little Rufus piece right here and replace it with a navy blue piece put on top instead of below, and then stick the eye right back in place, it looks way better. I would also, though this would be a tad more complicated, move the eyes forward as they're actually very close to the bill and not in the center of the head. But that would be logistically more difficult. And by the way, Lego, if you would like to hire a zoologist to assess future animal models for anatomical accuracy, 
I can tell you that working for Lego would be a childhood dream come true. My contact info is in the description. Have your Lego people contact my people. And I look forward to a long and anatomically accurate partnership. But for now, I'll transform it back to the way that it was instead of the way that it could have been if Lego had hired me a few months ago. But if you come to see this set here at Clint's Reptile Room in the future, don't be shocked if it doesn't have anaconda eyes anymore. Anyway, the white on the throat and the rufous and white stripes on the head are both great details. Really, my biggest complaint with the front, even bigger than the eyes, is just with the feet. And it has nothing to do with the fact that they have the wrong number of toes. Though they do have the wrong number of toes. I'm really fine with this choice. Kingfishers have really weird feet. I honestly can't believe we don't talk about their weird feet more. This kingfisher has two toes on each foot coming forward and none out the back. And that's fine. In this position, you probably wouldn't be able to see the rear-facing toe. And though they have three front-facing toes, the inner and middle toes are fused for much of their length. You'd need to make some really special pieces to show that off. So depicting two toes out front is a totally reasonable stylistic and logistical choice given the constraints of Legos. My only hang-up is that they're tan. Why are they tan? Common kingfishers have reddish-orange feet, except as juveniles when they're black. So in a model where color has been so far very accurate, and that includes zero tan pieces, how did you arrive at tan feet? I find it baffling. Even more baffling than the color issues on the backside. Because if you turn it this way, you will see that the back and part of the wings are a much brighter blue. And common kingfishers do have bright metallic blue on their backs, though generally it's more of a stripe that extends onto the tail, where it's not present here, and not onto the wings, where it is present here. I do get why they made it cover the whole back, as the back is, rather ingeniously in my assessment, made of a single piece which is most commonly used as a canopy for spaceships. Unless they painted the stripe, the whole thing needs to be either bright blue or navy. And given that the stripe is sometimes rather wide, I would prefer the whole back over no stripe at all. But this set could have been improved by making the tail bright blue and these pieces on the wings navy. And overall, I'm really impressed with this set, and really all of them. Well, I mean, except for maybe this shark. I would move the eyes, and of course I would make the feet orange. Why are they not orange? But by and large, it's amazing. The giraffe also comes with this wee flamingo, and the shark with this uh, cartoon crab. I'd be happy to talk about them in the future if you would like to see more videos like this. So let me know. And Lego, I'll, I'll be expecting to hear from you soon. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Not to mention the other projections on the ventral side of the giraffe, which uh, would have made my day had those been included. Made your day. Yes, it would have. Why, why, why would that have made your day? It might have been the first ever Lego phallus. <laughs> <laughs> Ungula grade is fully on the toe tips, like a horse or any other oh, ungulate. Yeah. Yep. Could, could you demonstrate with your your feet? If I had my point shoes on. <laughs> Plantigrade. grade. Digitigrade! Undulagrade! <laughs> I was building this stand for quite a while before I knew it wasn't the beetle. <laughs> it's getting this great horn shape. I mean, it's kinda... Good. It's the first thing you build. You're like out of pieces. By the time you're done with the stand, you're like, is there still enough for the beetle? <laughs> And they attach to the helicopter by a kind of ratcheting joint. Oops, I broke his head off. Shouldn't do that, though. He could still mate. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, they can bend and twist and <laughs> not that many ways. <laughs> Gotta simmer down a little there, Clinty. Getting webbed appendages, it's not necessarily that it worked its way up slowly. I mean, people are born with webbed hands and feet. I had I had a neighbor as a kid who had one webbed foot. I had a neighbor with one webbed foot. Yeah, so it's probably a somatic mutation. Were we neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> I think so.